Okay, uh, next up is Helen. Can you see me? Can you hear me? Yes, yes. So okay. uh, whenever you're ready. Okay, hi, I'm Helen. I'm a first year PhD student at the University of Manchester. So I'm not actually looking for a job at the moment, but if anyone wants to collaborate, you know. Um, but I'm in the Cosmochemistry group. Um, so there's a few other people, I think, in this group who are also giving their presentations. Today, I did my bachelor's and master's in astrophysics, where I did a lot of spectroscopy, first uh, with galaxies in the zone of avoidance, and then um, infrared spectroscopy of red giants, looking at their dust shells and how that affects their mass loss rate. And now I'm working on looking for water in unequilibrated ordinary chondrites, or more generally just like looking for the volatile inventory of these with Roman Tartes and Rianne Jones. Um, do you want to go to the next slide? I mean, so basically, I'll briefly explain where the chondrites come from. You have your uh, dense molecular cloud for the solar system collapses, you get your protosun and your protosolar nebula. And this is where you get your formation of your refractory elements, but I don't really care about them, so I won't speak any more about them. Instead, I want to talk about what happens after. So you then get your protoplanetary nebula where you get your asteroids and your comets forming. And the asteroids are where the vast majority of these chondrites, or in general meteorites, but specifically chondrites are coming from. Ordinary are the most common of the chondrites. So most common on Earth, that is. And unequilibrated is used to describe their petrology. So they're not heavily aqueously altered and they're also not heavily thermally metamorphosed, which is good for looking for volatiles. And there's actually been work done on some of these UOCs in the past where they've found volatiles. And I'm going to be looking at the D to H ratios, deuterium being heavy hydrogen, because the way that you, you can use it as a tracer for where water should have originated from where the molecular cloud would have had a high D to H ratio in the water, and then it collapsed, the central bit would have had all of it destroyed in the protosun. And then you have isotopic exchange as you get further away from there because it's relative to the temperature. And so you'd expect things from the inner solar system to have a lower D to H ratio than the comets in the outer solar system. And this is what you see on this plot, for example, which is a collection of a lot of other data but when you see these yellow dots at the top, they're bulk co uh, ordinary chondrite measurements which don't fit in with what is expected based on these previous models. And it also goes against the idea of isotope dichotomy where you have two distinct populations, your carbonaceous and your non-carbonaceous, with the ordinary chondrites coming in the non-carbonaceous group which should have formed in the inner solar system and have lower D to H ratios. So I am hoping to either disprove the, these previous results, say actually these are wrong and ordinary chondrites do fit in with what we expect, or if not, then we have to kind of rethink the models of how the solar system formed and where we're getting this sort of water from. I'm using, can you do the next slide? Um, so the, I'm only in my first year and I don't have much to go on at the moment, but I'm using SEM and Raman in Manchester to characterize these samples initially, look for fine-grained matrix where I can do nanosims in the future. And the nanosims will be used to um, do the actual isotopic analysis. Um, I'm hopefully going to maybe be doing some XRD as well because uh, that's another non-destructive way that I can sort of look for where I'm going to be finding most of these hydrated phases, the phyllosilicates, places where I want to find out how how much volatiles are in there. Um, yeah, I don't. If anyone has any ways to contribute to my work, that would be great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Helen. And up next, we have Tom. 
Okay, cool. Hello. Can you hear me okay? Yes, yes. Fantastic. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Tom uh, and I'm also a PhD student at the University of Manchester. I'm in my second year uh, studying in the isotope geochemistry and cosmochemistry research group. Uh, I have approached planetary science from a geology background. I did my undergraduate in geology at Royal Holloway uh, University of London and then completed a taught master's in geoscience at University College London. Um, as part of that degree, I completed a research project investigating the origins of Josephinite, which is a native, well, a terrestrial native metal um, from Oregon. My experience in that project led me to apply to my current project at the University of Manchester, where my main project, I said project a lot there, is uh, researching metal particles uh, from extraterrestrial bodies such as asteroids and the moon, supervised by Katie Joy and Rianne Jones. Um, in an, if, yeah, if we could hop to the next slide, that'd be great, please. Thank you. Uh, in an impact between asteroids and or um, other planetesimals, there's a very large exchange of energy, which commonly causes significant melting and even vaporization of the target and impactor bodies. Um, within rocks that contain some of this impact melt material, we commonly observe metal particles that have formed through a variety of processes associated with uh, the impact um, and that these metal particles are derived from material from both the, theoretically the target and the impactor involved in an impact. These particles can preserve information about the composition and physical conditions and chemical conditions of impacts in the solar system so it's useful to understand them. I'm using a range of analytical techniques to investigate the effect the impact melt entrainment has on these particles to see if we can gain any understanding of how impact melting has changed the metal from its host body. So to do that, um, I am kind of using the scanning electron microscope and electron microprobe techniques to understand the kind of major and minor element geochemistry of these particles. And when we can get back to the labs later this year, I'm hoping that we'll be able to use the laser ablation ICPMS system at Manchester to look at trace elements such as the highly siderophile elements um, and then to look at the microstructure, the crystallographic microstructure of these metal particles. I'm using electron backscatter diffraction to investigate how the kind of crystallographic textures of these particles has been altered by uh, entrainment and impact melt. So in addition to this, if we hit to the next slide please, um, I'm also assisting with some of the curation and characterization activities associated with the uh, UK-led Lost Meteorites of Antarctica project. And a big part of that for me has been using photogrammetry software and suites of high-resolution photographs to make high-fidelity 3D models of uh, the samples that are returned. So this is done using a pixel matching algorithm, which generates successively more detailed point clouds in 3D space matching pixels from different pictures uh, and that this produces a, a 3D model which can then be textured with a mosaic merged from photos within the suite of kind of typically a couple of hundred of pictures. Uh, this is useful for a number of reasons uh, including the long-term preservation of a record of the sample exterior which is important as many extraterrestrial samples are broken up for various analyses, meaning that the initial sample geometry and kind of relationship between different fragments is not necessarily preserved. The models can also be used as a non-destructive uh, technique for determining sample volume and as an extension of that sample density. And so um, that the effectiveness of that compared to a couple of other techniques we're currently investigating. Uh, and of course, the, one of the end products of that is that you have pretty beautiful um, 3D models of some of the samples and you can see in some of the pictures down here, the, the top row is pictures from the raw photo set and then two different angles on the finalized models that I've been able to make from them. Uh, so if anybody has any questions about any of the things that I've kind of spoken about there, then um, feel free to get in touch. That's great. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. And uh, up next is Ben. 
Great, great. Um, so hi everyone, my name is uh, Ben. I uh, again come from a, a geology background. Uh, I got my earth science degree from the uh, University of Glasgow. But I'm currently in the fourth year of a, a planetary science PhD at the uh, University of Manchester, where I'm supervised by Greg Holland and Rianne Jones. Uh, and I'm due to finish in uh, either the summer or the autumn of this year. So the title of my uh, current PhD project is uh, Volatile Redistributions During Impact Melting in the Early Inner Solar System. So impact is, is arguably one of the most prevalent processes in solar system evolution. Uh, and on occasion, these impacts are actually powerful enough to produce impact melt. So you could assume that these melts were completely degassed to volatiles. However, this is sort of a really important thing to know for sure, as there was likely a lot of melt formation during uh, the accretion and the bombardment of the terrestrial planets. So because of this, um, my project investigates ordinary chondrites to determine what effect impact melt has had on, uh, on their volatile contents. The volatiles I'm specifically investigating are uh, noble gases and halogens, as these are really good tracers of the behavior of volatiles, including water, during uh, geological processing. So as part of this project, first uh, I take an ordinary chondrite that contains impact melt, and I conduct sample preparation, such as sectioning chips and preparing polished sample mounts. I then characterize the petrology of the melted and unmelted fractions uh, of the meteorite, uh, so that I can compare them directly. And for this, I mainly use techniques such as optical and electron microscopy and some electron probe analyses. I then use a, a noble gas mass spectrometer to um, determine their noble gas contents, and I release the gases during these, uh, these analyses uh, by laser step heating. And then I determine the chronology of the two fractions uh, using the argon 40, argon 39 geochronometer so that I can then uh, comment on if these two fractions, the host and the melt, have underwent similar impact histories. And then the last sort of uh, analysis I undertake is to determine the, the bulk halogen content of the fractions uh, through the neutron-induced noble gas mass spectrometric technique. This involves irradiating uh, the two fractions so that a portion of the halogens are converted to noble gases. These noble gases um, can then be measured using a traditional noble gas mass spectrometer, and this actually allows for our halogen abundances to be determined down to the parts per billion level. Uh, it overcomes quite a lot of the problems that you have uh, just measuring halogens directly. And so with all this information, this allows me to address what effect impact melt processing uh, might have had on the volatile contents of ordinary chondrites. Uh, my study involves looking at six ordinary chondrites, um, which have various melt volumes, shock states, and cooling rates. And this allows us to explore these factors in relation to the volatile behavior during uh, impact melting. So our results to date suggest, uh, interestingly, that uh, volatiles are not necessarily preferentially lost from the melt during impact melt processing, as one might expect. But obviously this is uh, ongoing at the moment, so we need to nail this down. Uh, the image on the far left that you can see is, um, is one of asteroid 493 Griseldis, because um, in 2015 this observation was made and um, it's consistent with a small impact on its surface. It's actually ejecting material, so I think it's very cool. Uh, and the image directly to its right is of a large impact melt vein within one of my samples um, that would have been formed by a similar collision, but likely one that was much more powerful, so either a lot faster or some larger objects. That's my current PhD project, um, which as I said is coming to an end. But I was also um, involved in an undergraduate research project um, uh, that was supervised by Lydia Hallis at the University of Glasgow. Uh, this involved using optical and electron microscopy to uh, characterize the petrology of numerous thin sections of the Martian meteorite Tessin, while also searching for the presence of uh, macromolecular carbon. This carbon was likely formed due to aqueous processes at or near the Martian surface. And so finding it in Tessin is really interesting because Tessin is a relatively young Martian meteorite about 570 million years old. So uh, finding this can imply that aqueous processes were still active near the Martian surface in relatively recent geological timescales. Uh, the image here is just one of uh, an area of macromolecular carbon within Tessin with an EDS spectra showing that it's, uh, it's full of carbon with that peak just there. Beyond this, I was also selected for the 2018 LPI Exploration Science Summer Internship. Uh, here, I was part of a team uh, where we worked to construct a geologic map and plan rover traverse routes in the, in the moons in the lunar south polar Schrodinger Basin, which is an area for, uh, that's been singled out for high priority science research. Uh, we utilized remote sensing data sets to complete this task, as well as ArcGIS to construct the finalized map. 
Uh, this year's internship has already, uh, sorry, that year's internship has already produced two peer-reviewed papers, and uh, a third is currently being written uh, in our mapping and traverse studies in that Schrodinger Basin. Uh, so I just thank everybody for taking time to listen today. And if you have any questions or queries about anything, then obviously send me an email or uh, I'll be available to chat in one of the breakout rooms. Thank you.